Good morning, Mindsetters. It is a beautiful Wednesday morning and you're hanging out with Looney and Natasha. Natasha, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Looney. It's very strange to be here on a Wednesday, Wednesday morning and not a for Monday afternoon. Mads, <laughs> actually. That is very strange. The Mindsetters, I hope you guys are excited. Natasha, what are we doing for the Mindsetters today? Okay, Mindsetters, well, you've already been in the mode of doing trigonometry because you've done some trig revision in the morning session already. So we're carrying on with trigonometry, but now we're looking at uh, paper two, the supplementary exam 2013. So if you have it at home, you can follow there. Um, so it's a supplementary 2013 and we're looking at all the trig questions in that paper. All right, mindset as you heard it, we're doing trig with Natasha. Don't forget that we do have a special spring school competition going on. So all you need to do is stop the clock, guys. It's similar to the one we had in past, but now it's all different. We've mixed it up. So what you need to do is tag yourself or share the post on our Facebook page. Our page is facebook.com forward slash learn extra with your favorite number from zero to nine. And then we'll stop the clock during the show. We won't tell you when. So basically you need to pick your favorite number from zero to nine. I would choose two and then tag myself and all of that stuff. Natasha, what number would you choose? Uh, I think I'd choose five. All right, so Natasha like and I have five. our favorite numbers. My favorite numbers two, hers is five. So tag yourself and share the, the post on the Facebook page and make sure that you do stay tuned because we will announce the overall winner for the competition at our last show at five o'clock. So make sure you watch that show, guys, and make sure, not at five, sorry, at half past four. Sorry, guys. Half past four, we will announce the winner. So make sure that we you do stay tuned. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter as well, at Lynn Extra, and with all that said, I will hand over to Natasha. Okay, guys, so I hope that you all are learning really, really hard. You've been revising, you've done some work in the morning, continuing with your revision, and I'm really glad that you guys tuned in to do a little bit more trig revision. As I said before, we are looking at trigonometry from the supplementary 2013 exam. So if you have it, you can follow along. But just a reminder, guys, and I'm sure you're already at the point in your studying where you know this, but trig is about 45 marks in your exam. So if you think of your exam being out of 150 marks, that's over 30%. So a very, very big section in paper two, 30% um, of the exam, you can almost pass if you get every single trig question correct, and that should be your aim. I find that a lot of the times the problem that some students have with trig is not really the trig, but the algebra. So you need to be very, very careful once you've gotten out of the trig format that your algebra, your signs, and the rest of it um, are spot on. Okay, so it's a big section with lots of marks, and what you'll notice with the questions that we've got, we're going to start with question eight from the supplementary exam. And you'll notice that we say here, in brackets, we've got paper two, question 8.1. But obviously, going through my numbering on the screen, for us, it's going to start at question one. But it doesn't mean that it's question one in the supplementary exam. If you're looking at the paper, it is question 8.1. All right. So the first one, simplify as far as possible. It's a little bit of trig identities in this one. Um, if you guys have tried this already, you probably think, oh, this is so easy. But guys, remember, it all just leads you to the point where you can do identities with no problems at all. And remember, if you want to get better marks in your final exam, revise, revise, revise. Okay, so important to revise. All right, so let's have a look here. We've got 1 minus sine squared plus 3 minus cos squared. So the most obvious thing to do is to say that 1 plus 3 is 4. Okay, so we've gotten rid of the two separate numbers, and we can write that as a single number. And then we've got minus sine squared theta minus cos squared theta. So, guys, you can group that together. All right, and if I put that together, you notice it sort of looks like an identity that you are familiar with. Remember, you know that sine squared plus cos squared is equal to 1. Remember that identity? It's one of the first ones that you will learn. Sine squared plus cos squared is 1. Now, if I look at what I've got, minus sine squared theta minus cos squared theta, problem there is this, uh, it's both uh, negative ratios, not the positive ones that we used to. So what do we do? We simply take out negative 1 as a common factor between minus sine squared and minus cos squared. So really just dividing each term by negative 1. And we'll be left with sine squared theta. Negative divided by negative is a positive, And then negative cos squared divided by negative 1 will be positive 
cos squared theta. All right, and then if you look within your brackets, sine squared plus cos squared is exactly what we know from our identity. Sine squared plus cos squared is 1. So therefore, this is going to become 4 minus 1 times 1, which is 1, and 4 minus 1 is 3. All right, so a nice, easy one to kick things off with. Just a reminder again of what we were looking at here, just reminding you of how you would use your identities and uh, reminding you about sine squared plus cos squared. If it's not exactly as that ratio as you know it, as the identity that you know, you can sometimes manipulate the equation that you're given or the uh, expression you're given to look like the identity that you used to. Okay, so always be looking out for those identities. Keep them in the back of your mind. All right, so question two, and if you are following from the paper, this is question 8.2. Here we are to simplify without the use of the calculator. Obviously, we stress this over and over again, and it becomes even more important as you go into exams. If they say without using a calculator, you will not be given full marks if you use a calculator. So for example, how could you use a calculator here? You could say, well, sine 150, get the ratio, put the answer in, easy peasy, done. But then you won't get all the marks. Okay. So how do we do it showing all the steps? Let's have a look. So we've got the square root of 4 to the power sine 150 times 2 to the power 3 tan 225. All right, so we're going to keep the square root. We know that it's all under the square root. Now, sine 150, yes, you can put it into your calculator and get your ratio, your special ratio immediately, but showing working, we'll say, well, sine 150, using reduction formula, I can write as sine 180 minus 30. Okay, why do I choose 30? Well, 30 is one of the special angles. So I've rewritten 150 as 180 minus 30. Then you remember from your cast diagram, remember the cast diagram? If I'm saying 180 minus, that's in the second quadrant. Sine is positive there, so this ratio is going to become sine, positive sine of 30, 30 degrees. All right. So I can replace sine of 150 with sine of 30. So it's 4 to the power sine 30. Then it's times, and we're going to do the same thing with the 3 tan 225. So we know tan. All right, and this pen doesn't seem to be playing along this morning, but uh, let's persevere. So tan 225. We can rewrite as 10. 225 is 180 plus 45. Okay, 180 plus 45 is 225. I look at the cast diagram now to see where does 180 plus lie. Now remember, 180 plus in the third quadrant. So therefore, tan in the third quadrant we know is positive. So tan 180 plus 45 is going to become positive tan 45. All right. So this is now, the power is now going to be reduced to 2 to the power 3 times tan. Okay, let's just get rid of that as a say. I'm not sure what's going on with our pen this morning. Uh, try and get that off for you guys. So it's not 3 to the power tan, it's 3 times tan, 45. Okay, now we've got 4 to the power sine 30 times 2 to the power 3 tan 45. I can rewrite using my special angles now. You can either use the special diagram that you've got or at this point, at this point, once you've shown enough working to get marks for what you've done, you now can use your calculator. So now you can say, okay, sine 30, plug it into the calculator, see what you get. Then that's acceptable. You haven't done the whole uh, question using the calculator, just the little part where you need to get your special angle. So you can now say sine 30 and you'll get a half. So I can rewrite the first part as 4 to the power of a half times 2 to the power 3, 
and tan 45, if you put it into your calculator or if you have using a special angle diagram, tan 45 will be 1. All right. Now, inside the square root, we've got something interesting. 4 to the power of a half, and this is where your algebra, you see, you don't forget about your algebra when you're doing paper 2. 4 to the power of a half is the same as the square root of 4. Okay, remember when you want to change from an exponent form into root 4, the top number is the number inside the, inside the square root, and then the denominator is your number in your root. Okay, so that we can say is the second root, the same as the square root. For example, if we have something that's a little let o less obvious, say we have 3 to the power 2 thirds, and I want to write that in um, a root form, 3 to the power 2 thirds, that would be, so we know the 3 is obviously going to go inside the root, all right? The number in the numerator will then become the power inside the root, and then the number in the denominator will become the number in the root. So 3 to the power 2 thirds is the same as the cube root of 3 squared. Okay, so that's a bit of algebra that hopefully you all remember by this point. So 4 to the power of a half is the same as the square root of 4. The square root of 4 we know is 2. All right, so we can replace 4 to the power of a half inside the root as 2. And then we've got times 2 to the power of 3. Okay, now you can simplify within your square root. If you want to, you can say 2 times 8 is 16. How did I get 8? 2 cubed, 2 to the power of 3, 2 times 2 times 2 is going to give me 8. 8 times 2 is 16. And the square root of 16 will give us 4. Okay, so guys, if you have a look at this, you'll see that we stopped doing the actual trig component of it way up in that step there. Okay, once we've gotten rid of the trig, the sine 30 and the tan 45, it's no longer trig. It just becomes a matter of applying your algebra rules. Okay, so that's why it's so important that when you get into paper two, don't now forget everything that you've learned for all these years in paper one. You need to keep all of that knowledge with you. All right. Uh, Luni, do we have any questions or can we carry on? No, you can carry on. All right, great. Okay, let's move on to the next part of question eight in the supplementary 2013 exam. All right, and this is question 8.3. Here we are given an identity or asked to prove an identity. Uh, so obviously, remember, guys, when you're trying to prove an identity, you're trying to prove left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. And what you need to do is you need to work, always when you do identities, work with the side that you can work with, basically, so the side that has the most information. And generally, with your identity questions, you'll see that there's more that you can do to the one side than the other side, okay? So you've got to look at your question, decide which side to work with, all right? So if we look at this one, we've got to prove that this whole fraction is equal to 1 plus sine x. Now, if you're going to try and work with the right-hand side, I mean, what are you going to do? It's already 1 plus sine x. We can't really go much further there, okay, without introducing some sort of complicated fractions in that. So we're going to leave the right-hand side alone, and we see that we've got a lot more information on the left-hand side. So this is the side that we want to work with. All right, we're trying to prove that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, and we're going to work with the left-hand side. Okay. So how do we work with this? We've got cos squared x sine squared x plus cos to the power 4x in the numerator. Now... Hopefully, from exponents, you guys remember, cos to the power 4x. Hopefully, you remember that we can rewrite that as cos squared x times cos squared x. Okay? Because just like in exponents, when your bases are the same, you add the powers, it's exactly the same when you are working with trig ratios, your rules for exponents still apply. So cos squared x times cos squared x will give me cos to the power of 4x. All right. So I'm going to start by simplifying the second term in the numerator. So I've got 
leaving the first term alone, cos squared x times sine squared x plus, and I'm going to rewrite the cos 4, as I just said to you guys, as cos squared x times cos squared x. Right, and then that's all over. In the, new, in the denominator, we've simply got 1 minus sine x. There doesn't seem to be much that we can do with that at this stage. So we're just going to bring it down. All right. Now, have a look at what you've got in the numerator. Cos squared x, sine squared x, plus cos squared x times cos squared x. And this is why I keep emphasizing to you guys it's important to remember your algebra. If you look in the numerator, we've got a common factor of cos squared x in both terms. I've got a common factor. That means I take the cos squared x out as a common factor. So that means I need to divide both terms by cos squared x, all right? So cos squared x times sine squared x divided by cos squared x will leave me with sine squared x as my first term. And then in the second term, we've got cos squared times cos squared. So obviously, if I divide by one of them, I'm just going to be left with cos squared x. And that's now all over 1 minus sine x. All right, guys, and this is where it's important. I mean, I know you get your identities uh, given to you um, on your information sheet, but if you already know this identity in your head, which is the one that you should really know, sine squared x plus cos squared x is 1. It makes things just so much quicker. You don't have to now go to the information sheet and look for what is sine squared x plus cos squared x. So if there's one that I can recommend that you guys remember, it's that basic one. So I can rewrite cos squared x plus sine squared x as 1. So that's the term inside the bracket. All reduces to 1. All right, so in the numerator, I now have cos squared x all over 1 minus sine x. But now, if you go back to the question you've got, or to the identity you've been asked to prove, we've got 1 plus sine x on the right-hand side. So how are we going to get from cos squared x over 1 minus sine x to 1 plus sine x? We don't even have any 1 plus sine x term. So how do we do that? All right? And this is where your identities become so important because if you know your identities well enough and you've been practicing enough from now until your exam, it will just come to you. You'll just know exactly what to do. All right? Remember, we're working towards 1 plus sine x. So we need to get rid of this cos squared x because it's got no place here. You know, there's no other term on the right-hand side with a cos in it. So we need to get rid of that cos squared x. How do we do it? We use identities once again. So that vital identity, sine squared plus cos squared is equal to, uh, or sine squared plus cos squared is equal to 1, that's the one we're going to use, and that's the one we're going to manipulate to try and get rid of the cos squared x. All right. So how do we do it? We say, well, we know that sine squared x, and I'm just showing you this working on the side. You don't need to show all of these steps. But I'm showing this to you on the side so that you understand. We've got sine squared plus cos squared is equal to 1. I can make cos squared the subject of the formula by taking the sine squared to the right-hand side. So then this will become cos squared x is 1 minus sine squared x. So that means I can rewrite cos squared x as 1 minus sine squared x. So now I can go back to my identity and I can say, well, cos squared x, I want that cos gone, so I can rewrite that as 1 minus sine squared x. And that's all over 1 minus sine x. All right. Now, guys, please, 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 it's a common mistake, and pupils do it over and over again, no matter how much we stress it. I don't know if it's just exam pressure or what it is. Sometimes people forget all the algebra, and then they start doing things like canceling the sine and the sine. Please don't cancel sine squared x with sine x. Remember, you cannot do that. These are separate terms. You cannot cancel terms across 
pluses and minuses. You just can't do it. It's not allowed. So please don't cancel the sine squared x with the sine x and say, okay, that just gives me sine x. Please, please, please remember that. Okay, you can't cancel across terms. So you can't cancel across that minus sign. What we are going to do is we can factorize 1 minus sine squared x using a difference of squares. Again, algebra. So 1 minus sine squared x is going to become 1 plus sine x times 1 minus sine x. Okay, and this makes us happy because we now see that we have a 1 plus sine x in this uh, expression, which is really good because now that everything is factorized, now we can certainly cancel the whole bracket. 1 minus sine x, cancel that with 1 minus sine x in the numerator. And what are we left with? We're left with 1 plus sine x. And that's exactly what we've been asked to prove. So that's equal to the right-hand side. So we're very happy because we know that we've got the right answer. Okay. All right, guys. So there's lots and lots of careless mistakes that I've gone through that you guys need to not make in your exam. Make them now while you're revising so that when it gets to the exam time, you're absolutely perfect. Okay. Algebra, again, cannot stress, and I'm going to say it throughout the show today, if your algebra is spot on, you shouldn't make careless mistakes in the trig section of your exam. All right. Um, I don't know if it's time to take a break or should we finish off with this section? How much do you have? Because we can take a break quickly and then come back after. All right. Yes, okay, break. I think it's time for an <laughs> idea. <laughs> My insight is we are going to take a very short break. Do stay tuned and I'll tell you more about our Facebook group for you guys to join the study group and the competition that we have. So don't go anyway. Welcome back, Mindsetters, from that very short break. Like I said in the beginning of the show, we do have a competition. You stop the clock, and our clock, we look at our Facebook likes and the last digit of our Facebook likes. And if your number is that very special number, then at, at 4 o'clock, our last show is at 4, so you need to watch the whole show, and we will announce the winner then. All you need to do is tag yourself or share the post. It is on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Tag or share the post and then write down your lucky number. Like I said in the beginning, my favorite number is two. So I would choose two and then tag myself and write down my favorite number. And then we'll check the winners at the last show, on our last show. So at four, four o'clock, sorry guys, four o'clock, make sure you are to, to, if, to see if, you've stand, if you stand a chance to win, guys. I'm so sorry. Tongue twister going on here. So make sure you do that. And we also have a maths group on our Facebook page, all you need to do is join it. It is a study group for all you mindsetters by the mindsetters, so make sure you join it and share your notes, share stuff that you don't understand, and we will keep checking that as well, guys. So, Natasha, straight back to you. But you do have a question. Okay. So, Bonola is asking, Natasha, can I write for the second step as root 2 to the power 2 times sine 30 times 2 to the power 3 times tan 45? Okay, so this is going back hmm. all the way to the second that one that we did with the reduction formula. All right, and you wanted to split up 4 to the power sine 50. What was that again? How would they like to write it? 2 to the power 2 times sine 30 times 2 to the power 3 times tan 45. Yeah. Okay, that's perfectly acceptable because all she's doing there is simply saying 4, I can rewrite as 2 squared, all right, which is fine. And then on the outside of that, that's raised to the power sine 30, which is perfectly acceptable. And then the same thing with 2 to the power 3 times tan 2 to 5, you can write that as 2 cubed and then keep your tan 45 in a bracket. Absolutely fine. All right, and then Gabelo, I'm not sure if you picked this up. He says you made a mistake on question one by forgetting to add three. Forgetting to add three. Let's ha go back to question. That was one of the very first things we did was we said one plus three is four. It's four. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, All right. so definitely was done there. No mistake. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, good. But I'm glad that you guys are awake this early and that you try to you know, follow. And um, whenever you have a problem, please let us know. Let us know exactly where the problem is. It makes it much easier for me to then go back and identify 
where the, the issue crept up. Okay, so now we're carrying on with uh, the supplementary 2013 exam, and we've got to question 8.4, if you're looking in the paper, our question 4. If you're looking in the paper, it's question 8.4. So far, we've had a look at some identities and some reduction formula, and we're pretty much carrying on in that vein for this question as well. All right. So they ask you to prove that for any angle, cos 3 theta is equal to 4 cos cubed theta minus 3 cos theta. They were actually really nice here in the exam because they said, hint, 3 theta is equal to theta plus 2 theta. Now, I've seen this question asked before where there's no hint given and people struggle, struggle, struggle. The hint actually makes the question really, really simple. Okay, so how do we use the hint? So you see, guys, we've got cos 3 theta in the left-hand side. But if you look at the right-hand side, you've got just thetas. Okay. Now, if you didn't have this hint, it becomes very tricky, and people do the strangest things. But with this hint, where 3 theta is equal to theta plus 2 theta, it means we can now use a bit of compound angles. And I'll show you how in a sec. Okay, so this leads us to compound angles, which is really nice. Remember here, you are being asked to prove. Like I said to you before, you look at your equation, and when an identity, you try and work with the side that you can do the most to. Um, in this case, you could probably work out the right-hand side as well. I think it will take you slightly longer, but I'm going to work with the left-hand side simply because they've given us this hint. Okay, so... And that's the nice thing about maths and trig and all of this is there's more than one way to do a question. Okay, so in this specific one, you could actually work with the right-hand side as well, but we're going to work with the left-hand side because of their hint. So we've got cos 3 theta. They told us, hey, you can break that down into cos 3 theta is just 2 theta plus theta. Okay, it's just the sum, right? Now, we've got to use compound angles. Remember your compound angles? If we have cos A plus B, right? From our compound angles, we can expand that into cos A times cos B. Very importantly, though, is when you're dealing with the cos compound expansion, you need to change your sign. So if it's originally a positive, it's going to become negative sine A sine B. Okay, so that's the expansion, and that's straight from your formula. Okay, all right, so I'm going to use that, and I'm going to try and expand cos of 2 theta plus theta. So we're going to get cos, following from my expansion, cos 2 theta times cos theta minus sine 2 theta times sine theta. All right? So I've got cos 2 theta times cos theta minus sine 2 theta times sine theta. Now, where do we want to go from there? This is when you need to go back to your question. Have a look at what you've got. You are asked to prove the right-hand side is 4 cos cubed theta minus 3 cos theta. Very importantly, you will notice that what's missing there on the right-hand side is a sine. All right, there's no sine theta there. So that straight away tells me that when I'm expanding the compound expansion, I need to try and get rid of all the sines and all the sine squares, and we only want to be left with cos theta. So that's actually really nice because it's a clue. It's a clue of what we should do. So I'm going to rewrite cos 2 theta. Now remember when you're dealing with your double angles, and if you've got cos, for example, 2a, there's several expansions we can use. The one being 2 cos squared a minus 1. The other one, 1 minus 2 sine squared a. And then we have cos squared a minus sine squared a. Right, so those are the three different ones you can choose from. But because we went back and I showed you guys that there was no sine squared. 
on the right hand side, it makes sense then logically that we should go for the first expansion, which is 2 cos squared a minus 1. So cos of 2 theta using double angles, I'm going to write as 2 cos squared theta minus 1, and then that's being times by cos theta. And then we say minus sine 2 theta, you've only got one option there, that's going to become 2 sine theta cos theta times sine theta. All right, let's simplify this. So I'm going to times the cos theta into the bracket. So I'll get 2 cos squared theta times cos theta is going to give me, let's go to a different color, 2 cos squared times cos is going to give me 2 cos cubed theta, right? Minus 1 times cos theta is just going to be negative cos theta. Then we've got 2 times sine theta cos theta times sine theta. We notice that the sine thetas can be multiplied together. Sine theta times sine theta is going to be sine squared. So it's going to become minus 2 sine squared theta times cos theta. All right, so we've simplified all of that to get to that step. Now what do we do? Well, we've got 2 cos cubed theta. Remember, we need to keep going back to see what are we supposed to be getting in this? What are we supposed to be getting out of this? And we go back and we see, okay, they're saying on the right-hand side we need 4 cos cubed theta. At the moment, I've only got 2 cos cubed theta. So I need another 2 in there. And then we've got minus 3 cos theta. So how do we get from 2 cos cubed theta to 4? I mean, from 2 cos, yeah, that's right, from 2 cos cubed theta to 4 cos uh, cubed theta. So we've already got the 2. Where's the other one coming from? So if we have a look, we've got, there's lots of different things we could do here. I think possibly the best one to go for is going to be, maybe let's take out the cos theta as a common factor from this bracket and see what happens. All right. Or... Another potential thing we can do is we can get rid of the sine squared theta. All right, and that's the one we're going to go for because if we had taken the cos theta out of that as a common factor, you would be left with a term that's going to be a little bit tricky to simplify. Not impossible, but tricky. So we want to try and minimize all the mistakes that we can potentially make. So possibly the easier way to approach this question is to get rid of the sine squared theta immediately. Because remember, when we looked at the right-hand side, there was no sine squared theta. How do I get rid of the sine squared theta? We're using identities again. We can say, well, sine squared theta from the identity cos squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. We can rewrite sine squared theta as 1 minus cos squared. All right. So now I'm going to go back to my expression and I'm going to change the sine squared to 1 minus cos squared, leaving everything else as it is. Okay. So we'll bring down 2 cos cubed theta. We'll bring down minus cos theta. And we're going to now get rid of this sine squared theta. All right, so we'll leave the 2 on the outside, and we're going to multiply. Sine squared theta, we can rewrite as 1 minus cos squared theta. And then obviously we've got to multiply by the 2 and the cos theta from the outside. All right. So we've simplified. We're going to get 2 cos cubed theta minus cos theta. Now, guys, we've got the 2 and the cos theta on the outside, so it's really just timesing by one term of 2 cos theta. So we multiply that into the bracket, and we're going to get minus 2 cos theta minus 2 times minus 1 is going to give me positive 2 cos theta times cos squared theta is going to give me cos cubed theta. All right. Now, if we have a look at what we've got, we've got some like terms, right? So I can say 2 cos cubed theta plus 2 cos cubed theta will give me 4 
cos cubed theta. And then I've got minus cos theta minus 2 cos theta will give me minus 3 cos theta. And that sounds awfully good to me because that should be exactly the same as the right-hand side. So let's have a look. 4 cos cubed minus 3 cos theta. Was that what we were supposed to show? Yes, it was. All right. So if you do it and it works out nicely, it's always so satisfying because sometimes there's so many detours you can make with these identities and it become a huge mess. Okay. If you do it properly, it works out really nicely and it's really, really satisfying. Okay. Now this question, 8.4, it had two parts. We had to show... Uh, prove the identity, but there was also another part to this question. They said, hence, very important that word. If they say hence, hence means use what you've just done. Hence show that if x is equal to cos 20, then 8x cubed minus 6x minus 1 is equal to naught. So if x is equal to cos 20, we've got to then show that this will give us uh, that cubic equation. All right, very interesting. How are we going to use what we've just done? Well, the only thing we've done really is proved an identity. They've then told us that x is the same as cos 20. So if x is equal to cos 20, let's use that in the identity that we've just proved. All right. Okay, so the identity we had was um, we ended up with cos... 3 theta, we showed that that was the same as 4 cos cubed theta. So this is now number B part, or the second part, is equal to 4 cos cubed theta minus 3 cos theta. That was proved. All right? Even, and it's important, guys, like some of you would get stuck here and say, but I haven't proved that. Even if you didn't prove that, take that from the previous question and move ahead with it if you can. So even though maybe you got stuck halfway with part one, if they say hence, assume that you have proved it and carry on because you don't want to lose marks if you don't have to because maybe you'll know how to do this one even though you might have made a little mistake in the first part. Okay, so always if they say a hence or otherwise kind of question, if it's a hence question, try and use what their deduction was from the first part to help you in the second part. Okay, so you would know cos 3 theta is equal to th that whole 4 cos cubed theta minus 3 cos theta, even if you didn't prove it yourself, because that was what you were asked to show. All right, so we've got that. And now we're also told that x is equal to cos 20. Now, if x is equal to cos 20, I can replace, wherever I see a cos of theta, I can replace it with x. So what I'm going to do first is I need to rewrite this. So I can say, well, I can write this as cos 3 times 20. I'm replacing all my angles with 20, so it looks like what uh, they've given. All right. So theta is 20 is equal to 4 cos cubed 20 minus 3 cos 20. All right, so I've just used what they've given us and I've replaced all of the cos thetas with cos 20. So now what do I get? Well, cos of 3 times 20, that's the same as saying cos 60, right? 3 times 20 is 60. And then they've also said each of your cos 20s is the same as x. So I can replace cos 20, so it's a substitution really. Cos of 20 is x. So this is going to become 4x cubed minus 3x. All right? Looking slightly more like what they want. How do we get there? Well, cos of 60, you can use your calculator. Cos of 60 is a half, and that's equal to 4 x cubed minus 3x, all right? If I now simply multiply through by the 2, so get rid of the denominator on both sides. So times through by 2 on both sides, get rid of your denominator. So we're going to end up with 1 is equal to 4 times 2 is 8x cubed minus 6x. Bring the 1 over to the other side and we get 8x cubed minus 6x minus 1 is equal to naught. 
All right. Let's go back to what they asked us to show and see if it is what they wanted. So it was 8x cubed minus 6x minus 1, and we got 8x cubed minus 6x minus 1. So this one, I have to admit, was a little bit tricky because you've got to do two things. You firstly need to get the equation in the form where you've got a cos 20 in it. Because once the cos 20 is there, you can then substitute your x's. So that was the little trick in this question. All right. Looney, do we have any questions? Everyone following? Um, we had a question here. Can we just find it? Okay, can we take a break and then I'll show you the okay, questions? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, mindset is we are going to take a very short break, but just a quick shout out to Shikash. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in and for watching Learn Extra Live and for posting on the Facebook page. We will take a short break, so do stay tuned, and we'll be back straight after this. Welcome back, Mindsetters, from that break. I hope you guys are still on path as I see some people want to kidnap Natasha until <laughs> the 5th of November. We see you, Leanne, and you can't, hey, because we want her here to help all the Mindsetters at home to pass the metric exam. Make sure, guys, you do go tag yourself and share the post on our Facebook page with your favorite num number from 0 to 9. And when we stop the clock, you might stand a chance to win, but you must make sure that you watch at 4 o'clock to see if you've won yourself that very special Learn Extra hamper. So with all that said, I'll take a straight back to Natasha. All right, guys. So I've had a quick quiz at the Facebook page, and uh, some of you have questions and identities in that. We will try and get to them if we can, but um, I want to really move on because the first part of this lesson, we've been just focusing on identities and reduction and that kind of thing. And I think, you know, there's obviously lots of other uh, important and tricky parts to trigonometry. So we're going to move on to question 10 in your supplementary exam. That's from this year, 2013. And question 10 is a graph question. All right, so they give you the graph of sine 2x, and they give this to you drawn in the exam. And they tell you that it's drawn for the period minus 180 to 90 degrees. All right, and if we just have a look, that's the graph that they've drawn, sine 2x, and they've given that to you on uh, the grid that they've provided. Okay, the first question is, write down the range of f. Now, remember, when we're talking about range, we are discussing the set of y values. So range is the set of y values. We want the minimum value and we want the maximum value and that will be the range. Okay, so what is the range for sine 2x? Now remember we've got, so this is 5.2, 5.1 sorry. So we've got sine 2x, we want to find the range of that graph. So remember when we're talking about range, we're talking about the set of y values. Okay, now that you can get just by looking at your graph. Remember we want to look at the maximum value and the minimum value. And I'm going to try and draw a line in here to highlight where that occurs. So there we go. There's our maximum. All right, and here is our minimum value. So you will see straight from your graph that your maximum value is 1. That's the highest that the sine graph will ever be. And then the minimum value is negative 1. So that's the lowest the sine graph is going to be. Okay, so sine of 2x, maximum 1, minimum negative 1. How do we write this? We're looking for the set of y values. There's different ways to write it. I'll write it in both ways. So the one way is you can say y is less than or equal to 1 and bigger than or equal to minus 1. Okay? Or we could write it as, so don't write both of these. These are just two different ways that you could write it. We can write it in inequality form like that, or we can use interval notation and say y is an element, open square brackets. Remember, square brackets mean including. So it's starting at minus 1, going up to 1, including 1. All right, so that just gives you the range. What's the minimum value? What is the maximum value? So it's from minus 1 to 1. The next part, so two really, really common typical questions when we're dealing with graphs. Find the range, set of y values. Next question, write down the period period we're talking about, the set of 
x values. Now, this one is slightly different because they don't want the period of the graph that they've given us. They want the period of f of 3 over 2x. So they've changed this into functional notation. f of 3 over 2x. What do we do with that? Now, remember, okay, so our graph f of x here. So this is 5.2. The graph f of x is equal to sine 2x. If I said to you, and I just want to remind you about interval notation here. So if I said, what is f of 30 degrees? What you would do is wherever there's an x, you would substitute 30. So this would become sine 2 times 30, and then that would become sine 60, and then you'd get your answer of 0 0.86. If I said to you, find f of 45, what would you do? You would substitute 45 in place of x, so it would become sine 2 times 45. So this is your functional notation that you hopefully used to, but you might have just uh, forgotten while we're doing paper 2, because this is really from your graph section. Sine of 2 times 45 is sine of 90, and then that would give us an answer of 1. So if they're asking us to find f of some value, what do we do with that some value? We substitute it in place of x, right? So they're asking me to find the period of f of 3 over 2x. Okay, was that right? 3 over 2? Yeah. f of 3 over 2x. So what does that mean? That means where I see an x, I need to replace it with 3 over 2x. So my function is now going to become sine of, what did we have here, remember? It was sine of 2x. We're going to keep the 2. The 2 is not affected. It is the x that we need to replace with our functional value of 3 over 2x. So this is going to become sine of 2 times 3 over 2x. All right? We can simplify that. The 2s cancel, so we end up with sine 3x. So not so scary looking anymore because sine 3x, what is the period of that? Remember, all you want to do is when you have a number that's going to alter your period. Remember, in the graphs, so for any of them, we're talking about the sine graph specifically. So if I've got sine ax, that a is going to affect the period of the graph. It's going to change the period. So in this case, sine 3x tells me there's going to be three sine graphs in the normal period, 0 to 360. To find your new period, you take your original period of your sine graph, which is 360, and you divide it by A. All right. So here, I'll say 360 divided by 3, and that will give me 120 degrees. So the period of sine 3x will be 120 degrees. What does that mean? It means that every 120 degrees, you will get a complete sine function. Okay, so that's what that means. Every 120 degrees, you're going to have a complete sine graph. And remember, the number, the 3, that tells you if you had to draw the sine function over the period 0 to 360, you will have three repeated sine graphs. Okay, so the number tells you how many graphs you will have in the original period 0 to 360. All right? So what, whatever your domain was that you had to sketch your graph for. Right? So the 120 tells you how long it's going to take to make a complete sine function. So in this case, it will take 120 degrees to get an entire sine function. All right. Okay, guys, so we're moving on now to the next part of this. It's still carrying on with question two. This is the third part. So it's the same question. You've got the sine graph drawn, but now they say, draw the graph of g of x is equal to cos of x minus 30, and that's in the domain that they've given you and on the same set of axes. All right, so first let's discuss what's happening here. You've got cos of x minus 30, so that's a transformation. What's happened to the graph? What's going to happen to the graph? Your normal cos x graph is now going to move, because it's x minus 30 degrees, it's now going to move 30 degrees 
to the right. So you're taking your original cos x graph and you're moving it 30 degrees to the right. That's what's happening to your cos graph. They want you to then impose this on the sine graph that you've already drawn, so you're going to draw it on the same system of axes. Okay, but you need to understand what the transformation means so that when you see the picture, it makes sense. Okay, I'm going to show you how to do this using your calculator. I think at this stage, you should all be able to draw your trig graphs using your calculator, and I know a lot of you like doing it that way. So I'm going to go step by step. It's going to be a long procedure because I'm going to get all of those points, and I'm literally going to go to the calculator, plot the points on the graph, to the calculator, plot, which is really what you guys should be doing as well. Okay, so we're going to do cos of x minus 30. We're going to get the points on the calculator. So this is 5.3 and we're drawing cos of x minus 30. Alright guys, what do we do? Call up the calculator and we are going to write the function in. So how do we write our function in? The first thing you need to do is you need to change your mode. We're currently in computation mode, we need to have a table, so we say 3. You'll notice that it comes up with your function f of x is equal to. We're going to then type in the function that we want, which is cos. We need to say x minus 30. Close the brackets. Okay, so you type in your function. Then you say equals. What are we saying? Where is it starting? Where is it going to? They want it drawn from minus 180 to 90. So we're going to start at minus 180. And we're going to end at 90. Okay, let's just go through that again. I've got cos x minus 30. That's my function, f of x. All right, for some reason it's coming up with two graphs. We don't have two graphs here. So we're going to leave g of x blank because we're only dealing with the f of x graph. So ignore the g of x. Your calculator, guys... Um, Got to sort this one out, but your calculator won't come up with two functions. It should be in univariate, which means only one variable. For some reason, this calculator has been set to multivariate, which means it's showing you two functions that you can put in. So we are only interested in this graph that we're going to call for now f of x is equal to x minus 30. Okay, so that's the one we want to draw. So we're going to start at negative 180. We're going to end at 90 degrees. It'll come up and say, what steps do you want to go up in? We want to go up in steps of 30 degrees so that we can have a nice evenly plotted function. And look at that. Fantastic. On your calculator, you've got two colum columns. You've got x, which gives you your x values. And then you've got f of x, which is going to give you your y values. Okay, so you're simply going to plot. You're going to look at your graph. You're going to say, where's one minus 180? Well, at minus 180, I plot negative 0, 0,86. You go to the next one. Negative 150, what do I plot there? Negative 1. Okay, so let's go through it in detail. So we're starting with negative 180, and I'm going to go up to the graph. And as I said, I'm literally going to call the calculator up every single time. So you guys can see it's not any magical thing that I'm doing. I'm literally just reading off points. So at negative 180, the value was negative 0, 0,86. So it was somewhere there, all right, and then you look in your calculator, you see, okay, minus 150, what's my value there? Minus 1. So, we look at our axis, we need to go now to minus 150, and then at minus 150, we're going to plot minus 1. All right, I want to show you on your grid what's happening in terms of your scale. Each of these little blocks represents 15 degrees, okay? So if we're looking for minus 150, the first one's going to be 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, and then we're going up in steps of 15, okay? So we've got uh, minus 90, minus 15 there, Mi so that's going to be minus 120, so our minus 150 is going to be at that point there. All right, so your scale here, your grid, is going up in little patches of 15. This is exactly the one that I've taken straight from the paper, so this is exactly what they've given you. Okay, so minus 150 is at that point there, and at minus 150, the value is minus 1. So we put a dot there. 
nice. I'm going to take off the little dots I've put on the line, on the axis. All right, so at minus 150, we plot minus 1. Let's go back to the calculator. And we see at minus 120, the value is negative 0, 0,866. So again, we go back to our drawing board and we say, okay, negative 120, where is that? So we've got minus 150 there, negative 120 is on that line, and we plot negative 0, 0,866. Back to your calculator, this is exactly how you would do it in your exam, obviously just much faster because you don't have to speak as you're doing it. At minus 90, it's negative 0, 0, 5. So where negative 90 is, we're going to plot negative 0, 0, 5, and negative 90 is... There we go, so that's negative 0, 0,5, so that's there. All right, call up your calculator again, go down. We see at negative 60, the value is now naught. So where the graph is at negative 60, we're going to plot 0, so that's there. All right, go down and across, negative 30, your plot, you will plot. 0, 0,5, so at negative 30, we plot 0, 0,5, which is up there. Okay. And go down again. At 0, 0, 0,866. So at 0 on the x-axis, we've got 0, 0,866 on the y-axis. And we're almost done. 30 degrees, we're going to plot 1. And at 60, 0, 0,866. All right. So let's try and get all of these done quickly. We've got 30, we've got 1. At 60, we've got 0, 0,866. And at 90, we've got 0, 0,5. So I'm going to try and put all of that down quickly so we don't have to keep uh, going backwards. So that's 1 there. And then at 60, which was there. And then at 90, our answer was 0, 0,5. All right. So all of that, we've got straight from... Okay, I've put the little spot for the 90 in the wrong place, sorry. Let's take that off. 90, which is on the, on the end here, 90 was 0, 0,5, so that's going to be at that point there. All right, so all of these pink dots, if we now join them up together, that will give us the graph of cos of x minus 30. So it's the graph of cos x minus 30, which has been moved 30 degrees to the right. Okay, so the graph of cos x has been moved 30 degrees to the right, and we end up with this function that we now have in pink. Obviously, yours will be much neater and much clearer to see because you've got your nice grid paper and you're working slowly, making notes as you go, make notes not to make mistakes simply just reading values off the calculator. And that's why I wanted to show you step by step, because so many people say, how do I use the calculator to draw my graph? Easy, easy, as I've shown you. Once you've got your function in there, really simple. Okay, simply plot all your points, join the dots together, and that's going to be cos of x minus 30. All right, so guys, I think at this point, now that you know all this information and you're excited about it, let's go through a break. All right, mind setters, we are going to take a break. Just before we do, I'd just like to send a special shout out to Digano. She's made it sure that I will send a shout out to her. So shout out to you, Lily. Hi, thank you so much for watching. And a shout out to Romila Gabelo, Lien, Piwe, Katle, Hotelane, Rivalelo. Yes, thank you so much for watching, guys. And Minently, I see you. Thank you for watching, and we will see you straight after this break, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. But without saying that, I can see that you guys are enjoying the show. We've got so many Natasha fans. You all want to steal her mind. You want to take her and kidnap her until you're done with your finals. Guys, you can't do that because we need her here. So thank you so much for tuning in. Gabelo, I did write down your question. We saw the picture and Natasha saw it. So we will work on it. And as soon as we have an answer for you, I will post it on the Facebook page so I didn't forget about you. Remember to tag yourself on the page and share the pictures. And... We have stopped the clock and it stopped on one. So if you have a favorite number zero to nine, make sure you watch at the end of the show if you've won, okay? At the end of our last show at four o'clock. So the number has stopped at one. So it's done, mindset. We're sorry if you didn't choose one. 
Better luck next time. But make sure you watch all the other shows and keep on entering, guys. Natasha, let's take it back to you. All right, guys. So hopefully you all follow that um, graph sketching and you all know how to draw a trigonometry graph, or in fact any graph, using your calculator. You simply plot the points from the functions you're given. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight through to some of the interpretation questions and I'm going to go through this the rest of the graph question uh, quite speedily because hopefully you all understand the basics of your graphs now at this point in the year. I think you do. I think you do, especially from some of the questions we've been getting. And I really want to try and get on to our last question for the day, um, which is the one on two-dimensional two tricks. So I'm going to go through this question quite speedily, as I said, quite swiftly. All right, so in this one, we are asked to say what the transformation that the graph of f has to undergo to get to the sine 2x plus 60. So I want to do this one to show you what happens, right? So remember, they've given you the graph sine 2x, which is f of x. They say, what do you have to do to this, uh, to the original graph, to get to sine 2x plus 60? So the original graph was sine 2x. And they say, what does that, what, have to ha what has to happen with that to get to this all you need to do, guys, is we simply simplify that to sine of, take your 2 out as a common factor within your bracket, and you'll get sine 2 times x plus 30 degrees. This is nice, because we've then got it in the form of sine 2 times. So your function is still the same, and all that's happening is your normal sine 2x graph has to move 30 degrees to the left. How do I know 30 degrees to the left? Well, I've taken child as a common factor. I get x plus 30. And remember, if there's a plus in here, your graph's moving to the left. And if there's a minus, your graph's going to move to the right. So sine x plus 30, the transformation, moving 30 degrees to the left. All right? And then we've got the next question, which says, all right, sorry, I went backwards there. The next question which says, and I cannot find the next question for some reason. There we go. There we go. I think this is it. Yes. Okay. Determine the general solution of sine 2x is equal to cos x minus 30. Okay. Remember general solution? Of this, they're basically asking you, remember we've drawn already cos x minus 30. So they're basically asking you to find the points of intersection of those two graphs, but by doing general solution. So let's go through that quite quickly. So sine of 2x, now we remember your general solutions, you need to solve for x using k plus, uh, plus k360 and the rest of it. I'm going to rewrite sine of 2x as cos... 90 minus 2x. Why do I want to do that? Well, if I change sine to cos 90 minus 2x, it's still exactly the same things. Because remember, the reason I can do that is because of cofunctions. We know that sine of theta is equal to cos 90 minus theta. Cofunctions, these two ratios are equivalent. So therefore, if I rewrite sine 2x as cos 90 minus 2x, I now have a cos on both sides of the equation, so I can drop them and then simply solve. All right, so I'm going to get 90 minus 2x is equal to x minus 30 plus k360. Now remember when you're dealing with the cos of a function, your general solution is always going to be plus or minus your reference angle on the other side. Okay, so it's plus or minus that angle plus k times 360. So we're going to get 90 minus 2x is equal to x minus 30 plus k times 360. Remember, k is an element of integers and you need to put that in. All right. Simplifying this, let's take the x to the one side. So we're going to get minus 2x minus uh, plus x, which is going to give me negative x. Bring the 90 over this way. So we're going to get minus 120 plus k times 360. Let's divide the negative out on the left-hand side. So we get x is equal to 120 minus k 
times 360. Remember, they just asked you for the general solution. They didn't say find the values. So therefore, we're going to stop with the general solution. We're not going to carry on to actually substitute values for k. We've got one more part to do, the negative version. So we're going to have, or 90 minus 2x is equal to negative x minus 30 plus k times 360. Again, k is an element of integers. Uh, what was this? This was 90 minus 2x. All right, so we're going to have negative x plus 30 plus k360. Take your x's over to one side. So we're going to have minus 2x plus x, which is going to give me negative x uh, is equal to, bring your 90 over. So we're going to get plus 30 plus 90, which is going to be plus 30 minus 90, sorry, that's because I'm trying to rush this, and that's exactly why you shouldn't rush through your exam, because that's when you're bound to make mistakes. So if I take the 90 over, it's going to become minus 90, minus 90 plus 30 is negative 60, plus k times 360, and then we can divide the negative out, so I get x is equal to 60 minus k times 360. Right, so that's your general solution. So k, remember, is an element of integers. I just want to go back up to this one to make sure my sign was correct. Okay, and I see, again, rushing, reason to make a mistake. Take the x over to the left-hand side. I get negative x, so this is supposed to become negative 3x is equal to negative 120. So this is just a little correction, guys. Sorry. Let's get rid of that. So we divide through by minus 3 and we get x is equal to negative 120 divided by negative 3 will give me 40 minus k times 360 divided by 3 is going to give me, what is 36 divided by 3? 120. All right. Okay, so you get x is 40 minus k times 120, and x is equal to 60 minus k times 360. So that's your general solution for this graph question. What does it mean? Let's go back to the graph that we've drawn, where we had both the graphs on one system of axes. That general solution, if we were asked to find solutions for that general solution, or find actual values for x, that's really where the graphs are intersecting. So that's all the points on your graph where the two graphs intersect. So if you were asked to find those solutions, it's really just points of intersection, but they didn't ask us for that. They just want a general solution. All right, so before we go to the break, I want you guys to go ahead, have a look at the paper, because this is the next one we're going to be looking at. So this is question 11 in the supplementary exam, and it's a two-dimensional question. When we come back, we'll have a look at that, Lunny. Are we taking a break? All right, Ryan Setters, you are going to take a break. Just a quick shout out to Erasmus and his study buddy, Masilo. Hello, Erasmus. Thank you so much for tuning in. Ryan Setters, let's take a quick break and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back, Mindsetters. We are on our final leg of this very fun race that we've been running of maths trigonometry. We do have a question from Marie Vallejo. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry if I'm not. Looney asks Natasha, what if they give cos x minus 30 without the intervals? How do you know the start, end, and the step? All right, they should always, if it's an exam, guys, they will always give you a domain. Um, you know, it's impossible for you to know what the domain is if they don't give it to you. It's normally taken as 0 to 360, but your questions in an exam will be very clear cut. They will give you the domain. Otherwise, I would say to be safe, you would have to draw it for the whole thing from minus 360 to 360. Your steps will still be 30 degrees as we showed you before. So your steps, your intervals will still be 30 degrees. But uh, generally in an exam, they'll always let you know what your domain should be. All right. right that's okay, good. guys. So we're going to quickly go over the last question that we can fit into this segment. And I'm so glad that you've all been following along. So as I said before the break, it's a two-dimensional question. And this is, well, a question on, two on 2D trig. 
So this is question 11 in the paper. They tell you that ABC is a right angle triangle. KC is the bisector of angle BCA. Angle BCA. That's that one there. And AC is equal to R units. And X is equal to angle KCB. Okay, so basically just stating the information that you've got. All right. 90 degree triangle, very important, because if they've given you 90 degrees, you don't have to use your sine cos area rules. You can use the, the ratios firstly. So sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. You can use those to solve cos of theta adjacent over hypotenuse. And then tan is opposite over adjacent. So we can use these ratios if we've got a 90 degree triangle. All right. The first question says, write down AB in terms of X and R. All right, now let's have a look. X being the angle um, BCK. Remember they told you that KC bisects BCA. So it was X plus X. So that whole angle there is going to be 2X. They've also given you that AC is R. So using the 90 degree triangle, we want to find AB. Well, if we're going from AB across, that's going to be the opposite side. That's your opposite. And the side we are given, the one opposite the 90 degree, that's going to be your hypotenuse. So therefore, we can say for AB, we know that sine, so this is part one, sine of 2x, is equal to opposite, which is AB, over hypotenuse, which is R. They gave that to you. So AB over R. Remember, we're looking for AB, so we cross multiply. Therefore, AB is going to be equal to R sine 2x. Okay, so that's the first part. Nice and easy, just working straight from the ratios and our 90 degree triangle. They then say give the size of X in terms of C, K, A. I think this question has been phrased the wrong way around. It's, it means give C, K, A in terms of X. So right angle C, K, A in terms of X. So C, K, A, C, K, A being this angle here. They want you to write that one in terms of X. All right, so what do we do? Well, I can see that that angle K is the exterior of triangle, exterior angle of triangle BKC. So therefore, it's going to be equal to the sum of the interior opposite. So it's going to be equal to X plus 90. So therefore, it's equal to 90 plus X. All right, so therefore, if I go into my question now, we can say CKA, just make sure I've tackled the right one, CKA, is going to be equal to 90 plus x. Right. Then they say, if it is given that AK is to AB, remember this is another way that we can write a ratio, all right? We can also write it as AK over AB. So they tell you that the ratio of AK to AB is two-thirds, all right? Calculate the value of x. So AK over AB is equal to two-thirds. We've already worked out what AB is, but we don't know what AK is. So we first need to work out what AK is before we can do anything with the given information. All right, so let's have a look at the diagram. We're looking for AK, which is this um, length there. So AK using triangle AKC, right? Remember, we know that AC is R. We have angle C, KCA, we have that as X, right? We're looking for KA, so we can use the sign rule. So I can say, and I'm going to try and fit it in here so we can keep the diagram up. So I'm going to say AC, AC over sine of angle AKC is going to be equal to, so I'm saying AC, which is that length, over sine of that angle is going to be equal to AK, which is what I'm looking for, over sine 
of x. And this is straight application of the sine rule. So AC, and we're going to need to get in a little bit more space here. So AC was R over sine 90 plus X is going to be equal to AK over sine X. And that's straight from the sine rule. So therefore, I'm going to get AK, if I cross multiply, is going to be equal to R sine X all over sine 90 plus X. All right. 90 plus X, co-function, sine of 90 plus X in the second quadrant. So using our co-functions, we're going to get R sine X all over cos X. All right, so AK is R sine X all over cos X. Now we've got to go back and hopefully we'll be able to finish this. We know what AK is, we know what AB is, and we've got that the ratio is two-thirds. So now remember AB we got as R sine 2X. So AB was R sine 2X. We've just worked out that AK was R sine X over cos X. And we know that from what they gave us, AK over AB is 2 over 3. So this ratio divided by that ratio is equal to 2 thirds. So let's set it up and hopefully we'll be able to finish it. But if not, you guys have all the tools. You can finish it up for yourself. So we've got R sine X over cos X divided by R sine 2x is equal to 2 over 3. All right, and what you simply have to do now is just simplify that. Let's see how far we get. So we're going to say R sine x all over cos x. We're dividing by R sine 2x, so it's the same as multiplying by 1 over R sine 2x. And that's equal to 2 thirds. And then all you're going to simply do is you can simplify sine of 2x. We know that sine of 2x is 2 sine x cos x. We can also see that the r's are going to cancel. So we're going to end up with sine x over cos x times by 1 over 2 sine x cos x is equal to two-thirds. And guys, I'm not going to be able to solve this for you because we are running out of time. But what you can simply see is the sine x would cancel. So you get one over two cos squared x is equal to two-thirds. And if you cross multiply that, you're going to get four cos squared x is equal to three. And all you simply have to do, which I'm going to leave for you guys to do, all you simply have to do now is take that equation, 4 cos squared x is equal to 3, and simply solve it as an equation so that you can find the value of x. All right. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that you've uh, learned a whole lot more about trig. Looney, over to you. All right. Thank you so much to Natasha and to all her fans, mindsetters. I see you all love Natasha and the teaching. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for watching the show and being awesome mindsetters. Remember, the clock was stopped at 1, so make sure you watch at 4 o'clock to see if you've won. I will see you at half past 2 for Life Sciences, so I'll check you out then. Until next time, we're out of here. Bye, guys. <laughs>